hello, welcome to the Lewis Kitchen at 1.13 a.m. on March 1st. That's my husband, Kevin. I'm talking quietly for two reasons. I'm still getting over a cold and my husband is asleep in the other room. If it looks like I just rolled out of bed, that's because that's exactly what just happened. But you know what? There are worse things than being up on the morning of middle grade March. Thank you, Krista, for no other reason than making my insomniac mornings that much better. So I've actually already finished one of the books that I was planning to read for middle grade March, and that is Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. Hang on, I'm gonna see if I can get you up a little higher, cause it's bugging me. Okay, seriously, I stack my iPad on like cans for you. I actually read this a little bit early because I couldn't wait to get started. Great book. I can see why my husband liked it. Because it's great, that's why. It's very much a survival tale about a native girl who ended up alone on an island based on a true story. The island, I think, was to the south of California. And in the true story, skip ahead like 10 seconds if you don't want to know a big spoiler for her story. But it's in the introduction to the book. But still, if you don't want to know the spoiler, skip ahead like 10 seconds. She dies like seven weeks after getting rescued. What? From disease, of course. So yeah, my heart. I mean, I cried so much while reading this. Maybe I can talk to her in heaven. One of the things that I loved about this is that she creates a skirt of green cormorant feathers while she's on the island. And that skirt ends up being saved and sent to Rome because it's such a beautiful specimen, I guess, of handicraft. Five out of five stars, absolutely. I want to read more by Scott O'Dell. Apparently he's like a really well-respected historical fiction author. I didn't even know that. And I started tonight, The Boxcar Children, The Castle Mystery, before it was middle grade March time. I've almost finished it because obviously it's really short and I read it for about an hour and I really am enjoying this, which shocked me. I was like, this is gonna be really boring, but no, it's actually great. I love the illustrations, they're super cute. There's a bunch of funny stuff in this castle, which is actually a museum. It's being transitioned into a museum. That's the plot of the book. The kids are all there in order to clean up the museum for its opening day, and then a mystery pops up. It's on the back of the book. If you wanna read it, you can. I just love how often the kids are just so polite. Like they say sorry if somebody's offended, even if the people are being really rude. <laughs> the kids are just like, oh, I'm sorry, did I say something wrong? Also, grandpa told Benny, a six-year-old boy, that a boy should only be told one thing once. And he was right, said Benny. This kid listens better than I do, that's for sure. I'm so impressed by these kids. And I also like that the author keeps breaking in with stuff like, and under a dust sheet covering a big chair, which Benny hadn't thought to check, sat someone who had been listening to every word they said. Dun, dun, dun. And also, Tom Brady. <laughs> So anyways, I am reading this one first because I asked Kevin, okay, which of your books do you want me to read first? And he was like, read a Boxcar Children first, which I think he did because I wasn't feeling so well. And he was like, I just want her to read something easy. <laughs> He's so sweet. It is now March 3rd. I feel like it's gonna get dark. I better turn on my light. Hang on. Started Johnny Tremaine. Michael Nip. He's such a nice guy. Uh, he'll be your best friend. He was commenting about this and saying that he had this like childhood hatred of this book and he was curious to see if there was a reason for that or what the reason was and if it lived up to his hatred, which he doubted. Well, Michael, I can understand why you didn't really like this book because you were probably a really obedient and humble and kind child and that is just not Johnny Tremaine. The year is 1773 and it's set in Boston. Johnny Tremaine is 14. He's an apprentice to a silversmith who is quite into his Bible. This silversmith guy is just really kind, but also doddering. He's really old. He's not really keeping track of things very well. And Johnny pretty much runs the shop. So it's not really a surprise that he acts like he owns the shop. But the silversmith keeps telling him, pride goeth before his fall, Johnny. And it's just frustrating that he doesn't get that through his thick head before something terrible happens. It's hard to watch him go through this, but he kind of deserves it. A little bit. He was he was a little bit like up on his high horse. The silversmith was actually a loyalist, which I thought was interesting. He was like, 
these revolutionary folk need to be in their Bibles more. <laughs> it makes me wonder if I would have been a loyalist because I tend to have that kind of conservative personality. I don't like the revolutionary thinking, but you know, I like America. I think it's a good thing. Really interesting book. I'm loving it. I I'm, lo I'm really loving it. Did I say that yet? I love it. I also did finish The Castle Mystery. This was a good relaxing read until they get locked in a cave. Then it was like, oh my gosh, danger. And, and then I couldn't read it at bed. <coughs> I'm not even kidding you. That's why I can't read mysteries at bedtime, even if they're not like thrillers. A while ago on a different video, Ryan from Seeking Stories, who by the way is another great content creator with his wife, their team, he had commented on my channel a while ago that they should make a TV series of the boxcar children and like rereading this. Yeah, like they really should. This is really fun. Now I remember why I loved these when I was young. Okay, I just had to show you this hilarious picture of Jesse like telling off some old guy. I don't want to give you any spoilers here, but man, these kids are just a riot. Okay, and then the last book that I have been reading is The Fantastic Mr. Fox. This one it was good last night when I had this migraine and I could not sleep. I, I couldn't do anything and I was just like, I bet I can read this. <laughs> and I did. I didn't read the whole thing because I fell asleep. Thank God. I was basically like waiting until the NyQuil kicked in and it finally kicked in while I was reading this. Thank you, Fantastic Mr. Fox. You saved me. Mr. Bunce and Mr. Bean and Mr. Whoever else. I don't know. There's three mean guys and they shoot off Mr. Fox's tail. <laughs> okay, this is about the Fantastic Mr. Fox and he keeps stealing chickens and ducks and stuff from the yards of the three farmers that I just mentioned. And so they're trying to shoot him <laughs> and pretty much dig him and his family out of their hole. That's what's going on right now in this. I'm loving it. Oh, and this picture is just wonderful. He's running away with two chickens in his back. He's got feathers everywhere. Why have I never read Roald Dahl before? Good afternoon. I have not updated you guys in several days. I believe it's the 10th because tomorrow the 11th is my birthday, but I do have more to say. So I finished The Fantastic Mr. Fox by Roald Dahl. I should try and face the sun. Hang on. Now you'll actually see the sun shining on the books. Yes, Una, I did really enjoy this author. His voice is just really, really funny. He's kind of like Daniel Handler, Lemony Snicket, you know, the author of the series of unfortunate events in the way he understands that there is nastiness in life and kids are not immune to it. I loved how Mr. Fox justifies any thieving that he does in here. When he's talking to a badger who's like, we shouldn't be stealing all this stuff. He says, my dear old furry frump, do you know anyone in the whole world who wouldn't swipe a few chickens if his children were starving to death? And also, my husband is a fantastic fox. <laughs> I'm gonna have to start saying that to Kev. Dread, somebody's texting me. Leaving our house now. Somebody's coming to pick up some meatballs that I made with my mom today for the foster family. So I need to actually be inside. Okay, and then I finished Ramona Quimby, age eight. I love how this family, it's dealing with money troubles. There's the dad who is wanting to provide for his family, but has to go back to school in order to do that. And then we have the mom who's actually providing for the family right now. I bet that was controversial at the time when she was writing this, but you know what? People do what they have to do, even if it's unpopular. They just love each other so much. At one point in the book, they're talking about how they hadn't been out to eat in months. And I'm like, oh my gosh, sometimes I, I find myself whining about stuff, but we can afford to go out once a week. Wow. And also a teacher says something about Ramona in this book that upsets Ramona and hurts her feelings. And I just love how it is handled, the whole thing. It's just like, yeah, that kind of stuff does happen when you're a kid and it does hurt your feelings. And I love that Ramona didn't just whine about it to a whole bunch of people. She digested the criticism and then eventually talked to her teacher about it. I just love that kind of realism in a children's book and how it takes just like a little bit of impertinence to make her feel better. <laughs> I also loved this illustration. Ramona and her dad are both drawing their feet. So cute. Look, see their feet are in. I also love that Ramona had to kind of solve her problem when she's staying at the Kemp's and she has to entertain Willa Jean rather than the grandmother taking care of Ramona. Ramona is taking care of Willa Jean. Again, that is the kind of thing that a kid would have to deal with and can't really complain about to the adult. It's kind of like the kid's problem to deal with. And Ramona is just like so grown up about that. All in all, I totally loved this book. It's basically Ramona and her family dealing with their father going back to work, not having enough money to support the family on his old checking job that used to make him 
very grumpy. And it's all about the adventures that she has going to what? Third grade. She's age eight in third grade and all the adventures she's having in school and just the kind of problems that kids run into. I also just started A Girl Named Disaster last night and I'm actually pretty far into it already because it's really entertaining. Oh wait, I think my people are here. I'll be right back. Okay, I just gave them my food. This is about a girl whose mother was killed by jaguars. She is sort of dealing with a curse. I don't want to get into spoilers too much because the whole beginning is set up. I'm still in the setup portion and I'm on page 16. Kind of like with Harry Potter how there's a lot of setup before he actually gets to Hogwarts. It's like that. It's so good. The setting is just so wonderful that I don't mind at all and I doubt kids would mind either. I think they'd find it really interesting. There's been some really interesting developments in here. She's almost kind of like a Cinderella character. She has to do all the chores while her cousin doesn't have to do any of that stuff. But she can't like hate her cousin because her cousin is very sweet tempered and just seems to love everybody. And to treat them really well and with kindness. But our main girl has a bit of a, a head on her shoulders. She just can't be okay with her situation without throwing in some comments. So one of them was, but who wouldn't be sweet tempered if she could sit in the shade all day? Because she's out working in the sun all day. She also has a creation story in here and it's very much like the Genesis story. There's a fall in it. Suddenly the people can't talk to their god anymore. I don't know any African creation stories other than some that might have been on the African continent. Oh, what's that one? There's a famous one that everybody red with Enkidu in it. I don't remember who the other characters are. That one may have been in Africa. Where exactly does this take place? It's Mozambique in the beginning and it ends up moving to Zimbabwe. I'm really enjoying the characters. There's a really wide variety of opinions on everything and Johnny Tremaine which I'm over halfway through. I'm like so into this. It's really hard for me to put it down when it's time to stop reading. I love the character of Rab. He's super well drawn. He's almost like a separate breed of human. They're called the Silsbees. It's the family name. It's talks about how it got really political during this time period, which I thought was interesting and a little bit sad. I really wish that the church would keep politics as much as possible out of the church because it really turns people off who have different politics. And politics are not the most important thing, you know? I also thought it was funny that somebody during the Boston Tea Party starts shoving tea into their pockets to save it up and sell it later. And Johnny's like, it's ruining the high moral tone of the party. <laughs> Definitely Johnny is running with a very raucous crowd. I'm sure I would not have been running with them. But they are the people who changed America and kind of made it what it was before, during, and after the Revolutionary War. So maybe that's a fault of mine. I don't know. But Johnny is actually changing for the better. He starts sticking up for somebody that he didn't stick up for in the past. Also halfway through The Secret Garden. I'm still listening to it on my phone. And I also started Echo by Pam Munos Ryan. I think that's her name. The author of Esperanza Rising, which I read a while ago. I love the beginning. It starts with like a fairy tale. I'm looking forward to getting further in that after I finish The Secret Garden. Well, hello there. It is now March 23rd. I don't even remember the last time I updated you guys. The whole COVID thing happened and things are insane. I've started tons of books and then I just haven't finished them. My head's just not in it, but I did finish Charlotte's Web. This was cute. I can see why my husband liked it. Because it's great, that's why. He practically grew up on a farm. He was in 4-H, he raised a lot of animals, he raised a pig. All of the farm animal talk in here probably really felt just like home to him. Yeah, the fact that it's about a spider, like I'm not a spider person, but I do like Charlotte. I didn't realize that E.B. White was a guy. <laughs> that sounds kind of stupid. I should know this kind of stuff, but I rarely check out biographical info of an author unless I'm so in love with their works that I just want to read everything by them and then I will go and find out more about them. But yeah, I didn't I didn't know E.B. White was a guy. I kind of thought it was a girl. <laughs> I don't know any girls who are such fans of spiders, so I should have known right away. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know that's a gender stereotype. This is about Wilbur the pig who is born a runt. This girl, Fern, pleads with her dad to let her raise him instead of him just, I think he was gonna shoot Wilbur <laughs> rather than try and raise him. And she was like, no dad, please let me raise the pig. I will love the pig. So she does for like six weeks and then they sell him to her grandfather and she goes and visits him every day after school. She just sits in the farmhouse and everybody's wondering what's going on with Fern. Is she getting a little weird? She starts saying that the animals are talking to her and to each other. But the reality is, yeah, they're talking. I love that there is some magical realism in here like when Fern's mom goes to the doctor and is like I'm kind of worried about my daughter talking to animals the doctor's like I wouldn't be surprised if they're talking I like 
the character of Charlotte, she says, I have to get my own living. Nobody feeds me. I live by my wits. I have to be sharp and clever lest I go hungry. She's talking to Wilbur, who's like, what? You have to trap and kill things and eat them to survive? That's terrible. And she's like, well, nobody's gonna do it for me. Wilbur was merely suffering the doubts and fears that often go with finding a new friend. But underneath her rather bold and cruel exterior, Charlotte had a kind heart and she was to prove loyal and true to the very end. So you know from pretty early on in the story that there is going to be an end. Whose end it is, you're not really sure unless you know the story, which I kind of knew the story. But death is a big theme in here. Life ends, it happens. Eudora Welty actually reviewed this in the New York Times book review. She said, what the book is about is friendship on earth, affection and protection, adventure and miracle, life and death, trust and treachery, pleasure and pain, and the passing of time. As a piece of work, it is just about perfect and just about magical in the way it is done. And I thought that was a really good way to describe it. At first I was surprised that Eudora Welty was on here, but then when I thought about it, I well, not really. Like I've read a lot of Eudora Welty's short stories and she kind of writes with a certain humor and sparkle about different people and their foibles and their lives. And she just felt like these characters were talking to her. So she was writing down their stories. So this is kind of like that. There's humor and sparkle and just people living stories, except they're animals instead of people. But there are people too. The song sparrow who knows how brief and lovely life is says sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. Sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. The whole theme of death and life ending is all over this book. I kind of like that for a kid's book, not having it be super dark and depressing about death, but death is there. That Kids need to have an awareness of that, I think. Maybe not in every book, but I think this book handles it really well. And it's funny that Wilbur begins to think that Charlotte's campaign against the insects is a sensible and useful thing. Everybody hates the flies. Everybody complains about the flies. As as the story goes on, he grows fonder and fonder of Charlotte and they become good friends. This book really is like all about friendship. Oh, and the doctor. I just really love this conversation with the doctor. Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Asks Mrs. Arable, that's Fern's mom. Oh no, said Dr. Dorian, I don't understand it. But for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learns to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle, but nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. I think sometimes people forget to look at life and realize how miraculous it is. <laughs> Once you've grown used to it, to the beauty and just the wonder of nature and, and people, sometimes it's hard to remember how miraculous it all is. And it really is miraculous. Dr. Dorian, do you believe animals talk? I never heard one say anything, he replied, but that proves nothing. It is quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me and I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. Perhaps if people talk talked less, animals would talk more. Wilbur's character is cute too, rather a modest pig. His fame doesn't go to his head. He knows it's all Charlotte's doing. I shouldn't spoil anything about the ending, but it did kind of upset me. There's nobody around when the sad thing happens. <laughs> Okay, that's it for this. Talk to you soon. Well, hello, it is now March 28th and I have read three more books. First, I wanna talk about A Girl Named Disaster. This one has been a little bit disappointing, not because it's a bad book, but because it's just not very riveting. The beginning totally was. We have a girl named Nemo who is the orphan of the family. She lives with her grandmother and two aunts, their aunt's pretty daughter and brand new baby, and a bunch of little kids. And the men live in a separate tent. This is a very rural poor village in Africa and that's just kind of how things go. However, it's matriarchal because the grandmother pretty much makes the rules. The author, Nancy Farmer, she does comment on that and many other things. One of the things that I love about Nancy Nancy Farmer is that she shows both sides of various issues. It's not a one-sided attack of anything. She really portrays things very carefully and unfortunately her care in portraying things in this book may have just slowed it down just enough for me to where I was like, this isn't very interesting. It still has to be an interesting story. The beginning, like I said, is really interesting. There's a lot of characters. I just am feeling for Nemo at that point of the story. And then it's essentially thought that there's some kind of evil spirit attacking them related to her past. And she essentially has to pay for that and make it better. And so she ends up, well, I don't want to spoil things, but it's on the back. Don't read the back or the inside cover of this. It just tells you essentially what happens like a third of the way through the book. So spoilers there. I understand why it was a Newberry book. It's very carefully put together, but I only got to page 150 something 
before I was just like, you know what? It's going very slow. I'm skimming over things. I just can't help it. I can't focus on it. It's not a bad story, but not for me. I'm just not really fond of the landscapes. There are ghosts. There's all kinds of tribal customs going on. But I don't care for survival stories for the most part. I really need more characters than that. And it's not that there's no characters. Like I said, the beginning has them and there are ghosts kind of accompanying her on its journey where she's on her own. You see her in this boat. I'm just having a hard time connecting with this. There's just no warm fuzzy relationships like at all. However, one of the things that I really did love is that Nemo has a very powerful imagination and she makes up songs. I am she who lifts mountains when she goes to hunt, who wears a mamba for a headband and a lion for a belt. Beware, I swallow elephants whole and pick my teeth with rhinoceros horns. I drink up rivers to get at the hippos. Let them hear my words. Nemo is coming and her hunger is great. I love that. And then there's, I don't know how you would pronounce that, but there's that. And then the women in this area have no brains. Their lips hang open like cooking pots. Their hair is grass left over from the dry season. Their skin feels like burned logs and their nostrils yawn like old warthog burrows. <laughs> Aren't those descriptions so great? Hair is grass left over from the dry season. Skin feels like burned logs. I mean, I, I love the descriptions in that. She's telling a story about two women who are fighting and that was one of the songs that one of the women sang. And I love how it interacts with various African stories. I would guess there's a lot of African terminology in here. It talks about about Portuguese colonists or settlers who are in the country making some trouble in some cases and trying to help the girls in other cases. I like a lot of what's in here. I'm just not finding it interesting enough to continue. I also just finished Old Yeller, which I can totally understand why my husband loved this. Because it's great, that's why because he grew up in a very rural area and he raised animals. This is all about a 14 year old boy named Travis who lives on the Texas frontier and he's taking care of his very little brother and his mother while their dad is away on the trail selling cattle. There's a wave of rabies around that really kicks into play in the end of the story. It does have a bit of a sad ending. However, there's a lot of humor in this and I love the adventures that the boy Travis has with this dog. They're about to have some dinner. He's been working hard all day doing his father's chores. He's supposed to be the man of the house now. Then he comes home to find that this random stray dog has just eaten all the meat that they had hanging up for supper that night. He's like a thieving rascal dog. His younger brother immediately falls completely in love with this dog. And so Travis has to deal with the dog. And it's a pretty funny story. There's all kinds of adventures that they have. They have to castrate pigs, sleep in a field overnight to protect the crops from raccoons. <laughs> There's just some crazy stuff that this kid has to do. And I could see why a kid would love to read this. I would have loved reading this if I was a kid, except for the ending. But the rest of the book, I really would have enjoyed. In a book for children, a lot of times the children are the really capable characters that are doing a whole lot that normally an adult would take care of that kind of thing. The mom character in this can be kind of obnoxiously simple, leaving stuff to the boy that should really not just be done to the boy. The boy is trying to say that, yeah, my younger brother shouldn't just be allowed to lie his head off about everything or throw rocks at everybody when he's angry. And mom's like, oh, you know, you were just like that. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, so <laughs> punch that boy. <laughs> I'm not ever judging other people's parenting because honestly, I'm not a parent, but I know that I wouldn't let my kid throw rocks at anybody. That would be a big no. <laughs> There's definitely some stuff in here where it's like, that's not realistic for a mom. <laughs> However, there were so many good things about this book. It was pretty fun to read a book that's so famous. We were just watching the Animaniacs. There's like e episodes or references to old screamer or old yellow. The boy speaks with a certain vernacular that's quite humorous. He uses a lot of slang. There's a very strong, voice to this book and I liked it. There's all these really detailed descriptions of things that he would have to do on the frontier or things that he would know living on the frontier that I wouldn't have known. It has a description of a dog chasing a raccoon and it talks about how raccoon has like a really thick hide that fills a dog's mouth like a wad of loose sacking and the dog has a hard time ever really biting the raccoon. The raccoon just squirms and twists around inside that hide. And then there's how the pigs stay warm in the winter. Just the various habits of animals. It's really interesting. I never would have known any of that. Clearly this guy has some experience or has done a lot of research before writing this book. Who is this author even? Fred Gibson, yep. 
Fred Gibson. And the dog. Oh, there's this great description of the dog. And the worst egg sucker and camp robber you ever laid eyes on. Still, you blind that old devil will, but there was never a better cow dog born. That is a cowboy talking about his best dog. There are some things that you might have to talk about with your kids if you read this with them, but great book. I really enjoyed this. And this was, again, one of Kev's favorites when he was little. And then we have another of Kevin's favorites, Hatchet. He never read A Girl Named Disaster. That was just something I wanted to read. But Hatchet was one that he loved. I've never actually met a person who didn't love this book. So imagine my surprise when I didn't love it. I liked it. I've tried reading this one on audiobook before and I'll get into that. This is about a 14 year old boy who survives a crane trap. A crane trash? Yeah, a plane crash in the Canadian wilds and the pilot doesn't survive. He's the only one who survives. He is alone. He pretty much has to survive in the wilderness after that. And I know that kids really enjoy this. I might have enjoyed it if I was a kid reading it. I don't know. But the style, honestly, for me, kind of killed it. And also the fact that he's alone for most of the book. For me, character relationships are what make the world go round. There is even some character development in this book. He has to really deal with some impatience in order to learn to problem solve or else he's gonna die. He almost does die multiple times because of impatience or just like not paying attention. So that changes him a lot. And I did enjoy seeing that character development, but he's alone. <laughs> The whole time. He's talking to himself and maybe that's why there are some repetitious elements that got on my nerves. The author writes like a kid would think or a kid maybe would talk and to me I don't really want to read that. I want it to be more sophisticated and I get that this is a kid's book. I mean simple can be good but oh, I don't know how to describe it so I'll just give you some quotes. See how like on this page there's like stopped, alone, he was alone, the plane. There's a lot of really short sentences like that. That's how I write on social media for humor or emphasis, but you don't write a whole book like that. Or I wouldn't. <laughs> it would just get annoying. It calls attention to itself. So he almost jumped with the word spoken aloud. It seemed so out of place, the sound. He tried it again. So, so. So here I am. Like, why so many so's? Why so many commas? Brian already knew the secret, but he did not know it would cause them to break up and thought it still might work out. The secret, comma, the secret <laughs> that his father still did not know, but that he would try to tell him, period, when he saw him, period. This punctuation man, it's driving me crazy. With his bow, he had done food. With his bow, comma, with an arrow fashioned by his own hands, he had done food, comma, had found a way to live. He had food. Really? I know, he had food. I got it. Overall, I am really glad that I finished this. I think it's a good book. It's just not the kind of book for me. I might recommend this to another kid considering how like every kid I've ever met loved it. Okay, and that's it for today. The Book of Boy, which I haven't touched in like a week. I started it and I didn't love the beginning. I thought it was really boring. I didn't like the style. I thought it was really clumsy, but I've only read the first few chapters. So that's a lot of judgment to pile onto a book that I have not even read very far in. <laughs> I forgot to wrap up The Secret Garden, which I was reading along with Kate Howe and a group of lovely ladies. Also my friend Siobhan from our online classics and award winners book club. Link in the description. I finished this up on the 26th or the 27th. The general consensus was that the beginning was great. The ending was a little weird. Some people still really did enjoy it and didn't mind the ending, but I'll explain why some of us were a little bit like, eh, I don't know about that. The story starts out in India with a very unpleasant girl named Mary who is just spoiled rotten and her parents don't care at all. They just tell all the servants to do whatever she wants. A cholera epidemic comes through, kills her parents, all the servants run away, leaving her alone in the house where she is eventually found alone and now an orphan. She ends up being sent to England to a manor called Misselthwaite Manor. And there she meets a Yorkshire family and the magic of nature, which is something she didn't really experience in India. She was inside all the time. She didn't go out into the country of India. She just was spoiled and unhappy. When she goes to England, it's such a different experience for her and her life improves dramatically. And there's also a mystery going on in the manor. The story is about what happens 
after that. Personally, I loved the beginning, especially the floral descriptions of the garden. She goes outside every day when she's in England because she just gets kind of bored. She doesn't have people waiting on her hand and foot and telling her stories. She goes outside and she starts getting stronger. She starts eating more because she's exercising. And there's all these flowers all over the place on the English moors. And talking to these kind of poor Yorkshire family servants really does her good. She's never met anyone like them. The people here don't just bow in reverence to her and do all of her whims. She has to actually deal with people for the first time and she realizes that she's kind of unpleasant. The nature element has a lot to do with that. And I didn't really realize how much it would until later at the end of the book, but there's just this kind of magic in the air and all the floral descriptions of all the flowers. She dreams of this secret garden that she hears about from the gardener. There was, oh, there was a secret garden where the wife of the guy who owns the manor like died there. And like, she's just like, I have to find this place. I've never wanted anything, but I want that. I want to find this secret garden. And so all the nature descriptions are just really kind of a lovely element. For me also, it was very spring-like here in California as I was reading this, so that definitely impacted it for me. I was also listening to it on audiobook, and the narrator, I'll put a picture of it right up here, who narrated it, it was just a YouTube guy, and he spoke with a Yorkshire accent, and that really brought the story to life. All of that was just very positive. I loved the character development. There's some friendships that happen. It's all really good. And then the ending happens, and it has to do with the magic. I really thought that the magic was like magical realism, or like fairy tale elements, or meta for some kind, but no, it's actually the author's Christian science beliefs exemplified in novel form. Like, I don't know, Atlas Shrugged, but for children, but totally different beliefs. It's not objectivism, it's Christian science. I didn't know anything about Christian science. Siobhan pointed out that, well, it is kind of nice to learn about somebody else's beliefs, and she's actually right in that sense. I never would have known anything about it, except for reading this. Kate Howe pointed out this whole Christian science thing. Some of the beliefs were just so evident in the book and I don't want to spoil anything about the ending so I'm not going to tell you what exactly happened. There's no real dissenting opinions. Even if there was one person who didn't agree with everybody else about what happened with the magic then it would have been a better book to me. But this was anyways very fun to read with all the people in the group and Siobhan and I'm very glad that we did it. Hello there guys, it is April 3rd. I'm just now getting a chance to film my last thoughts from the middle grade March reads. The second to last book that I finished <laughs> was Johnny Tremaine. I think it was one of the first books I started this month. It was one of those really exciting books that I could not read at bedtime. It was just too exciting too interesting, so I had to find the time around reading Hester by Margaret Oliphant for the Victorian read-along. I was kind of trying to fit this one in, whereas most of the other books that I read were middle grade that I could read at bedtime, which is usually the kind of middle grade I read. That's why I don't read a ton of new middle grade or like really serious stuff like the award winners. Usually <laughs> they're just a little too serious for me to relax and go to sleep. But this one was totally worth it. Basically it's about war and the kind of people who go to war and why they go to war. And specifically, it's about the Revolutionary War and two boys who fight in it in their own ways and their friends. It's about why the Whigs and the Tories fought each other in the Revolutionary War. The Whigs were the political faction that wanted to separate from England because they felt like they should be able to vote on who represents them before their government. And the Tories were the loyalists to England who pretty much thought everything would work out. Now, both of the boys that were following are wigs and we meet a lot of really famous Boston wigs like Sam Adams and Paul Revere. Lots of historical characters popping up in this historical novel. Apparently the author Esther Forbes was actually a pretty famous history writer at the time before she wrote Johnny Tremaine and then she just kind of sat down and decided to try her hand at fiction and she wrote all about the period that she knew so much about but it was still a story like it really has a heart and the characters are really there and I love that about it. It's not just a litany of historical things with poor excuses for characterization, which I have seen in some historical fiction. There's a reason why this one's a classic. You don't get a lot of sympathy 
towards the English in this book. There's a few, like there's an English deserter soldier who he just wants his own farm and a cow, which he can't have in England. So he essentially deserts the army so that he can get that. But there's not a ton of like loyal British characters in here. So that is kind of like a, I mean, it's a very American book in that way. I don't think there's any indigenous representation and it doesn't talk about that at all so it's a little bit dated in those aspects but as regards showing the wig point of view great book i really did enjoy it loved the character change that johnny and other characters undergo mostly johnny johnny is the one who really undergoes the character change the last book that i finished for middle grade march which i actually finished on april 1st was the book of boy by katherine gilbert murdoch i didn't like this book at all we had a live show on it on Instagram. Krista from Books and Jams and Katie from Life Between Words hosted that, which that was really fun to see what everybody else thought of this book. Michael showed up. He made like so many good points about this book. He read it as well. I have a whole litany of complaints. It's supposed to be like a mystery, like twisty journey plot. No, there's two surprises. They come within like two pages of each other. They're fun. I liked the book better after, after the twists, but this book needed to do a lot more if it was gonna keep me interested. I would have put this book down for sure if it hadn't been a read along because it was so boring. It starts off with Boy who lives with a physical abnormality which makes him an outcast in 1350. And there's like a little author's note at the back talking about the research she did for this book which was extensive. A sort of pilgrim comes along and decides to take the boy with him to protect a sacred relic in a town three days away. They end up running into a whole bunch of sacred relics which are the body parts of saints. It was really weird. Honestly we don't learn about what the quest and the relics are really all about and what the goals of the characters are for a really long time not until much later in the book over halfway and so i was bored that whole time it just felt like very aimless wandering to me i knew that one of the characters had a plan and the other had sort of a plan, but honestly, I wasn't connecting to the characters and there wasn't enough description about the world around them that was really interesting. The development of the world building was just not good until we get to Rome, which is at the very end of the book. There's some descriptions of ancient Rome in 1350. It was pretty much a wreck and she did a lot of research on that and that definitely shows I enjoyed the section set in Rome, but only the setting part of it. I didn't enjoy anything else about it. That was like the only thing I really enjoyed other than the cover art, which I think is gorgeous. I really don't understand why this was given a Newbery honor. I don't understand why anybody would like this. But regardless, I really did enjoy discussing it with people on Instagram and other places. I've been discussing it with Michael and also Victoria reads too much. So it has been fun to connect with people over the book. That's why I like read-alongs. Even if you don't really love the book. It's just fun to talk with people about books that you've recently read together. Obviously Middle Grade March was wonderful. I loved it. Thank you again Krista and Katie. It was really really lovely. It's I just feel like Middle Grade March is a true community. There's just so many people who love each other and just comment on each other's videos. It really just is a community and I really appreciate that. Th that's again why I joined BookTube. I really wanted that sense of community that I was missing in my life and I knew after watching Krista's videos that I would find it here. Thank you so much for watching this vlog. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again so much for watching guys. Please like and comment and subscribe. I hope you'll tell me down below what you liked about this video, about Middle Grade March, about your latest books, whatever you want to talk about. I would love to talk to you down below. Thank you so much guys. Take care.